Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to another episode of Movie House Memories, the podcast where we look back and review the films that we think are the most important films in cinema history. I'm Patrick, and with me, as always, this week are two people who spend a large portion of their lives in dark and movie theaters. First, Matt is missing. Yeah, Matt is missing. He's MIA. Must come back, asleep. Matt. Come back, Matt. Yeah, he's out with Miss Daisy, uh, stuck out in the <laughs> middle of nowhere. All right. First, she's one of the co-hosts of Sunday Seconds with the Duke, the John Wayne retrospective podcast, which can be heard every fifth of the month on the MHN Podcast Network, the sole female voice of the show, and my podcast better half, Lori Flores. Hello. Also with us is he's one of the frequent co-hosts of both Lunchtime Movie Review, uh, Movie Hat, or trying to remember all the podcasts you're on. You're on every podcast, right, Shay? <laughs> So, um, I think so. So you're on Not Sunday sure. seconds. You're on <laughs> Movie House Memories now. Now that we're in the new year, you're a regular. Uh, you're on Lunchtime Movie Review. You've been on Mail Bonding. You've been on Sunday or um, no, Number Two Review before. Uh, is there a podcast you haven't done on this network? <laughs> I there, don't think so. Not yet. There's more. I saw him post something on Instagram that he was doing another podcast. He's He's he gets around with yeah. podcasts. Are you cheating on us now, Matt? Is that what it is? <laughs> we can't give you enough well, business here. Well, I don't know. If someone <laughs> asks me to say something, I'll I'll do it. But you guys are always going to be my number one. All right, I got you. As long as we're we're number, you're number one. Do you want to <laughs> plug your, the other podcast? Your no, of course not. <laughs> Why not? It's a movie podcast. Um. Well, there's two. All right then. Uh, straight no. chilling. <laughs> <laughs> two, two straight. I guess straight killing podcast is a horror podcast only, and those guys get me on every now and then. And we'll oh, just I gotta check that episode. out. I love. And movies. my friend Matt, who runs a um, website, he's been doing it for ten years down under here in Australia. Matt's movie reviews. Last year, we started doing like a series of Oscar and award season podcasts about predictions and. That's what um, I just think a new one just came out. So, well, it's January now, so you're probably going to get a few if you listen to Matt's movie reviews and all our predictions. But other than that, uh, Movie House Memories is the best. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to check those out. They'll sound good. Well, yeah, Straight Chillin' is cool. They know their horror stuff more than I do, so it's actually quite fun um, to be part of that one and Matt. Matt, Matt's movie reviews. I see him around at all the screenings and the media things that I do here in Australia. So we've been friends for a while. All right, just don't forget us. Yeah. No way, Laurie. <laughs> and in, in addition to uh, Shane's moonlighting with other podcasts, he's also going to be starting Criterion Critics with me and Bobby later this month in January. And I'm sure, uh, we, although we haven't discussed it formally, we could put pressure on Mark right now. Last year, he hosted the uh, Academy Awards pr uh, Predictions podcast on Movie House Concessions. I'm assuming you're going to do that again this year? I would absolutely love to do that again. I thought it was great last time, and um, if you guys are up for it, I'll, I will be happy to host. Well, as the guy, this who, is my year. Yeah, this as the guy who predicted on the uh, for the podcast, we didn't do all the uh, categories, but on the <laughs> podcast, all categories he picked, I got right. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you're I'm going down this water. year, Patrick. You're going down. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I think I've heard that before. <laughs> Since 1990. <laughs> yes, since 1990. And well, there's some good movies on the horizon. I think mm -hmm. it'll be a, a good awards season, from I what I can so tell. I think so, too. I think so, too. 
All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, Matt may be joining us in a few minutes. And before we get started, we'd like to thank all the returning listeners to the show and welcome all new listeners to Movie House Memories. Thanks for downloading us and giving us a try. We appreciate your time and attention and hope you keep on listening and following us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories. On either one of those two social media outlets, you can keep informed about our occasional written film reviews, news on upcoming theatrical releases, and information on many upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network, including this show, Movie House Memories, or one of the growing number of sister shows like Lunchtime Movie Review, The Number Two Review, Mail Bonding, Sunday Seconds with the Duke, Movie House Concessions, The Golden Age of the Silver Screen, Film, film Noir, I always want to go Film Noir, Noirsville, and of course Criterion <laughs> Critics that we just mentioned, as well as all the podcasts that Shane does on the side. <laughs> which, Come on, I saw that many. Hey, well, I Ooh. will give all credence. If they're smart enough to put you on the podcast, then they already know what they're doing, and you should give them a listen, that's for sure. So our po- Thanks, podcast definitely elevated when we actually had a film critic and not one who's just an amateur status <laughs> but all right and whether you're a frequent listener or a brand new fan of our little show we hope that you take the time after you're done listening and provide us with a little feedback you can do this one of two ways if you download us off itunes or stitcher you can go on to one of those two platforms and rate our podcast and leave a little comment about the show additionally you can also visit our website at moviehousememories.com and leave a comment about either our podcasts our opinions or the films that we're reviewing finally on your webs on our website you can leave your star review rating of the film we have discussed so that you can we can get a consensus rating from the mhm podcast podcast network community as always, we'd love to hear positive feedback, but we appreciate anything anyone has to say about any of our little shows. Now, with the horrible business out of the way, let's get on to this month's, sorry, this week's pick for one of the greatest films of all time, uh, Driving Miss Daisy, Shane's next pick for one of the greatest films of all time. And Shane, do you have a summary for us? Yes, I do. Can you tell me a story? The Best Picture winner that directed itself begins with Daisy Worthen, Jessica Tandy, having a car mishap in her own driveway, ending up in the neighbour's yard. Licence revoked, she has difficulty getting around until her businessman, textile company owner, um, son, Bully, Dan Aykroyd, arranges a driver, Hoke Colburn, Morgan Freeman. Not keen at first, Daisy is slowly chipped away for his acknowledgement as Hope convinces her to let him drive her to the store after following her down the street. It takes some getting used to, however, Daisy soon realises Hope's here to help while keeping her strict outer shell intact. Thinking he stole a can of salmon, Daisy alerts Bully to dismiss Hoke. However, Hoke returns the can he took the day before due to his meal being unsatisfactory and all is forgotten. During a peaceful moment at the cemetery visiting her late husband, Hoke confesses he cannot read. Daisy helps him on the spot. Then at Christmas, passes on a gift to help him learn writing like she did to her students as a teacher back in the day. Although Daisy says it's not a Christmas present to keep up her hard exterior. On a road trip, ignorant policemen question Hoke, then unduly remark on them both as they drive away. They also take a wrong turn, and in a moment of authority, Hoke needs to leave the car for a minute on personal grounds, as Daisy, in that moment herself, is afraid in the dark. All alone, she realises she needs Hoke. Long-time maid Adela passes away. Friendship between Hoke and Daisy blooms further. Time moves on. They become two peas in a pod in mind and spirit, even culminating in a Martin Luther King event, which Daisy attends alone after only thinking of asking Hoke to come along inside. He listens to the inspirational speech on the car radio while waiting outside. One morning, as usual, Hoke arrives at the house. This time something is wrong, finding Daisy slowly showing signs of dementia, looking for school papers, recalling her job as a teacher. Then in a moment of regaining clarity, Daisy admits to Hoke he is her best friend. Jumping two years later, Daisy has been in a nursing home and the house is up for sale. Uli and Hoke visit her and having a good day, Daisy is alert enough to respond to Hoke. Ask him a few questions, then let him feed her Thanksgiving pie. Fade out, that is driving this Daisy. All right. Films are influenced by the time they are made in, and uh, we look back at some of the big news events in Lori Flores' headlines of the time. (laughs) 
Okay, the year was 1989. Mikhail Gorbachev became president of the Soviet Union. After 28 years, the B Berlin Wall was open to the West. Communist governments also lost footing in Czechoslovakia and in Romania. Um, U.S. troops invaded Panama looking to capture Manuel Noriega. An earthquake in the San Francisco area, known as the World Series quake, struck while the um, Oakland A's and the San Francisco Giants were warming up in Candlestick Park. Um, deaths in 1989 included Lucille Ball and Betty Davis. Album of the Year was Faith by George Michael. Song of the Year was Don't Worry, Be Happy by Bobby McFerrin. <laughs> and, <laughs> and playing in theaters in 1989 were films such as Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Field of Dreams, The Little Mermaid, Batman, Dead Poet Society, Lethal Weapon, and Shane's Pick for Lethal one of the top 100 films, Driving Miss Daisy. Lethal Weapon 2. Lethal Weapon, Lethal Weapon 2? 2? <laughs> yep, Lethal Weapon came out in 87. Lethal Weapon oh. 2 came out in 89. My bad, I forgot the <laughs> Roman numerals. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good year in movies. It was, it really was. Yeah, that was... And that, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that was the summer, first summer I worked at the movie theater, and that, that was a phenomenal summer. So you really did start right after I quit. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. That's why I could finally we work there. We missed each finally. other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's a look at was... 19, to 1989. It, it was our, I mean, it was our winter, but your summer. But things like Ghostbusters 2 and Batman and, I mean, Indiana Jones, there was a Karate Kid movie. I think um, there was, like, The Abyss, the James Cameron yeah. movie came out around then. It was huge. I mean, oh, that that's was only just... Movie. Yeah, that's just a few. I mean, that summer, the theater I worked at had uh, Last Crusade. It started off with Field of Dreams, which was kind of a surprise, smaller hit. Then came Last Crusade, Star Trek V, not so much a big hit, but uh, was expected to be a big hit. It was, you know, we had on multiple screens, Ghostbusters 2, Batman, of course, was the huge blockbuster of the summer. Um, yeah. And then Lethal Weapon 2 was kind of a big surprise. That really kind of took off. You had Abyss, you had Weekend at Bernie's, you had When Harry Met Sally, all summer movies. Uh, I'm trying to think of all, there was the... Karate Kid three, or the next Karate Kid. No, it was Karate Kid Part Three that came out that yeah. that summer. That was yeah, that wasn't so good. And then <clears throat> I'm trying to think of what else came out towards the end of the summer. You had Lock Up with uh, Sylvester Stallone, which wasn't a bad film. Um, got a lot of uh, panning at the time, but uh, it was it was a big. I mean, we were busy all summer. I only worked there for three months before I went back for my senior year, and it was. I mean, it was a busy, busy three months. I saw Last Crusade probably about a hundred and ten times that summer. Uh, let's not forget Weekend at Bernie's and License to Kill. I think came out around. Oh, there. that's your right. License to Kill did come out that summer and went very, very quickly. That unfortunately did not. Wait, wait, out. is License? To kill Kirstie Alley. What? No. You're, thinking what shoot, you're thinking Shoot to Kill with Tom oh, okay. Berenger. Yeah. I love that movie. I love that movie. Yeah, that's a decent movie, yeah. I love that movie. Okay. Li I don't think I saw License to Kill, kill then. Was that um, Stephen James Seagal? Bond. James Bond. Oh, it's James Bond. <laughs> I'm so dumb. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a James Bond fan. That's all right. No one rem no one remembers Timothy Dalton as much as I do. Oh, that was Timothy Dalton? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that was not the good Timothy Dalton one. <laughs> There's only I did two. I like him in The Rocketeer. Uh, he's, he's, he was better in that than he was in License to Kill. But, uh, I object. <laughs> you, you can. You're overseas. It doesn't count. So. All right. Let's, let's start with talking about this movie, Driving Miss Daisy. Uh, oh, and how do we forget? Uh, do the Right Thing came out that summer as well. And I'm Matt. All right, he's finally here. <laughs> G'day, Matt. Yay, okay. Matt's here. My apologies to everyone. <laughs> so, no problem. We were so worried, so so worried. 
Well, the good news is Fry's had brisket on sale for like a buck eighty a pound, so I bought like half a cow. All right. Well, that's good. All right. I got to go. I got to get some brisket. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt gets... I've never tried it. Oh, you you need to have some barbecue brisket. You're missing out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not a, as good as Gowana, but, you know... <laughs> <laughs> That's Goanna. Goanna, whatever. <laughs> when you come to Arizona, we'll get you some. Yeah, we'll get you. We'll take you out to barbecue when you come to Arizona. Excellent. Look right. forward to that. As well, as, I've heard of um, grits. Is that a thing still? Yeah, yeah it's grit. It's yeah, not really, that's gross. Yeah, it's not really in Arizona. I mean, a little bit, but it's, it's a southern. We yeah. can take like them to Cracker like Barrel. Southeast, southeast yeah. type thing. <laughs> yeah, we can go okay. to Cracker Barrel. Yeah. <laughs> um, you get more of uh, the Mexican flavor uh, since we're so close to the border here. So, <laughs> like sounds chor- good. Like chorizo, that's that's pretty good. I like chorizo. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's good stuff. <clears throat> so greasy, <laughs> yeah, very greasy. All right, uh, we start by talking about the casting of film, and now that we're all here, let's get started. Starting with the lead, arguably the lead. She's the title character. Uh, Miss Daisy, Jessica Tandy, uh, Shane, what did you think of or her playing uh, Miss Daisy? Jessica Tandy was very believable and good. I just think that I think a lot of her own personality might have come out in this film to some extent. I don't believe that she'd be so upfront and thick skinned um, when I've seen Jessica Tandy interviewed in the past before she passed away. But uh, I, I totally was convinced in her role and I thought she was just great. I just fell in love with her with this movie and, you know, she was kind of off my radar until this. And then I remember just fall in love with her and, and her husband and Hume Cronin. That was the same, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. And I just think what this movie, the first word that comes to mind is subtle I just think that it's it's not a preachy movie, and I think the the all of the actors are that way too, and I think she really, her and Morgan Freeman really carry the movie with their with their strength and their and their presence, and I can't see another actress playing that role. She was good. Uh, I didn't realize how old she was. She she didn't seem so old. They must have done some some good makeup on her. I mean, she looked old at the end, but. You know, when the movie started, I thought she was in her maybe, I don't know, 60s. She played it well. I think she, she deserved the award she got. I, I can imagine the role being played better, because at times I I wasn't entirely sure of what I was getting from her, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't really explain that either. I, but I, there were just a few times where I felt like it wasn't the way I would have hoped to see it performed, but that might just be my problem. So, you know. I would accept a rebuttal from from Ms. Tandy if she wanted to offer one. <laughs> she um, she turned eighty during production of this film. I watched a documentary on the making of it, and during the production, she actually turned eighty. She looked amazing. She was so beautiful. I like Jessica Tandy, but I can't say that I thought it was a stretch of a role. I've seen her in a few things leading up to this, uh, the Cocoon movies. Uh, and uh, batteries not inclu- included, and well, I guess she wasn't in Cancun too. She was in the first one, but you know, so I was familiar with her ahead of time. I also remember her in A World According to Garp. I really liked her in that film, and she, I mean, she she's comfortable in the role. I don't think there's anything about the role that required her to stretch, other than she had to have chemistry with Morgan Freeman, and she does have that, and I really enjoyed that even though that it even at the beginning she's not supposed to have this chemistry that you could still see that at least there was there was something there that was working between the actors and i really i really really liked that on the screen you don't see that very often especially in a non-romantic role but speaking of morgan freeman what did you think of him uh playing hoke in this film hey you guys sorry Okay, he, he, was, he was not in Goonies at all. So that's it from was, the electric company. I know that, but <laughs> I will always think of, uh, it's not Chunk, Sloth is, is screaming that in the Goonies. <laughs> oh, yeah, I probably sounded more like him than I did the beginning of the electric company. Uh, I anyway. didn't say it, you did. <laughs> <laughs> he is is so good in this movie, though. It is hard to watch at the beginning when... 
because of racism and, you know, the way that, that African Americans had to kind of the, what's the word I'm looking for? That they had to behave a certain way that was horrible and demeaning. And that, that was hard to watch, but he did that. And I liked how as their relationship developed, he became more him himself. I mean, he became less, obliging and you know like for example when he had to use the restroom and he said I'm a man and I have to go and you know I just I I enjoyed watching as their relationship developed and he um, kind of um, was more of himself as the the character I think and um, I I think he he was brilliant in this role yeah, he was he was really good, and I I I think um, he really was really deep inside this character, I, and I like what Laurie said. I, he kind of he kind of became more of himself as the movie progressed, but that more of himself had all of the goodness that that the earlier character had, you know, on, on a more on a more sincere, personable level, right? He was he was always just you know very. Um, very charitable and very kind and, and seemed very sincere. But as he began to assert himself, he was able to do that while maintaining that, that real uh, optimistic and, and charitable spirit that he had. So really, really interesting character, really well done, I think. And, and he, he just nailed it. Uh, I totally agree with Laurie. Also, he, his demeanor changed um, throughout the film as it progressed. And the chemistry between them is just, fantastic and morgan had played that role before on stage before it was adapted to screen so he was pretty well aware of that would have changed some of the, the screenplay for the film but um he was still aware of how the character progressed and i thought the presence on screen was was perfect it was great I, i've already stated i think the chemistry between the two of them i think his acting is probably the most impressive so far that he really kind of becomes a character in light of the fact that what the other roles that I've seen Morgan Freeman in that I, I I wasn't trying to downplay Jessica Tandy by saying that, you know, she didn't surprise me because I seen her play. Not, I don't want to say the same role, but a similar role. There wasn't a lot of stretch for Morgan Freeman. You know, I've seen him in such a variety of different roles over the, the time since this film, even at this the film there had been a, only a couple of films he's he'd been in but you know coming out of like street smart coming into this film and then just later the same year uh in glory uh you know, another film that touches on you know, racism a little bit <laughs> uh, that a little bit yeah just a little bit just a tad uh, it's a, a phenomenal uh, you know uh transition for him that to see him play that and and I agree with you there's a lot of subtlety to his character and his character arc that I think he plays really really well that helps define the relationship between the two characters and then there was the surprise of Dan Aykroyd in this film Matt what did you think of Mr Aykroyd I tell you what when I first saw Dan Aykroyd sporting that southern accent, I was ready for a, a disaster to happen. Um, <laughs> but you know what? He he pulled it off. He did okay. I've I've never seen Dan Aykroyd in a role where I really thought he displayed some some real Oscar worthy acting chops. But um, for where my expectations were, he far exceeded them, and I think he was serviceable otherwise. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Although I didn't, I don't agree with what Matt said about expecting the worst. I mean, back when I first saw this, I would have really only known uh, Dan Aykroyd from Ghostbusters. I, I would assume, or maybe I had seen Blues Brothers, but it wouldn't have had an impact on me back then because I didn't really get into it until later in life. How did and you forget? Great. How did you forget Doctor Detroit? How could you forget <laughs> yeah. neighbors? All those, all those I saw after <laughs> Ghostbusters. For Trading sure. places. Trading places. My, my stepmother's an alien. Oh, now you're just going into really <laughs> bad films, Laurie. Well, I, I think that was the same year as this, too, or the year after, because it was around 89, 90 when that got released, Stepmother is an Alien. But you're right. I mean, all movies like that, I, I was aware who Dan Aykroyd was, but to me, Ghostbusters was everything. So 
seeing this movie and him just taking like a total right turn into a character that I wouldn't have expected or or anything, and then revisiting the film again for the podcast. He was he was great. I mean, he was likable. His mannerisms and the makeup that went with it just worked for me. And I don't know if it was just me, but was he bigger at the beginning? Like, he seemed really overweight and portly. And as he got older, he was a lot thinner, unless that was just the makeup. Um, it worked for his character, too. And I liked how he had a heart of gold. He really did. Oh, well, they shot it in reverse order, so he actually just got bigger throughout the film. So. <laughs> Okay. I don't know. Um, I think 1989 was the year I realized how talented comics are, and went because you know Robin Williams and Dead Poet Society, and then Dan Aykroyd in this, and I just realized what great actors, um, comedians are, and I just remember being so impressed with him in this, and he is great, and again he has the subtlety to his character. And, you know, the, the relationship with his mom and and that he has even, it, it's just the characters in this film are some of the most interesting characters I've ever seen. And they're they're just so dimensional. And um, I, I just loved him in this film. And I think they all deserve their nominations. And I wish they had all won. Well, one of them did. There you go. You know, Dan Aykroyd is the surprise of this film uh, that, you know, I like Dan Aykroyd in certain films. I know him as a comedian. This is always the surprise of his, uh, to me, of his career is that he's really good in it. I really think he does a good job playing a supporting role in the film. And I don't know why he hasn't done more of that out throughout his career. I, I don't know if, if he, it was that he wasn't being offered these type of roles you know, for lead work as a as drama, but you've seen him in films like even in into the night, he has a supporting role in a very brief portion of the film and it's not really played up for comedy. It's, it's kind of dramatic in what he does and he does a good job at it. And so I don't think it's ego, but I, I wonder why he didn't, especially when he got nominated for an Academy award, why he didn't spin this off into being more of a character actor in drama. Um, and cause he's decent at it, you know, and, 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 and he's a likable character. He's a, a really likable guy in a lot of the films, even in the bad ones. And there's a lot of bad ones for Dan Aykroyd, unfortunately. So I love spies like us. That is a very, very bad one. That is a horror. Is it really? One. It is bad. I, I like oh, it too, Matt. It has, thank some, you, Shane. has its funny moments. Uh, Patrick, I wish you had an opinion. <laughs> well, Come on. When he, when he farts in the test. And manages to get the other guy to cop to it. That that's good comedy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> whatever. I like Ghostbusters. I really like well, Ghostbusters. He's great. I, I forgot about that bit, Matt. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and he was, that was a Dan Aykroyd. But we have to mention how great he was on Saturday Night Live. He well, yeah, he was. I mean, but he was very that in Saturday Night Live. In most of his roles, he's so over the top. That's where a lot of his worst comedies are, is he goes over the top. For, like, Ghostbusters, he downplays it a lot. I mean, he's playing it almost straight. He's not playing it for laughs. And if then if you look at something like Nothing But Trouble, which is, oh, my God, is so bad. <laughs> it's just so, so bad. You know, he's, he's, you know, ramping it up to 11. And, and it just doesn't play well. And that's... You know, he was. Well, he was in uh, My Girl as well with Jamie Lee Curtis, and that that was kind of that's straight, the one I was role. trying to remember. He was good in that. I knew there was another one that he was. Dramatic My Girl in. one and two, he was playing the straight yeah. guy in that yeah. kind of too, and he was successful because they were both big hits and not bad films. No, I mean, yeah, and, and made every kid in America cry the first one, and then made every kid in America not want to go see the second one, but. All right, well, let's talk about Matt's moral universe now that he's actually here, Matt. <laughs> yeah, so I, there are a couple of things that struck me in particular, and I think one was the way that um, the way that the, the family, um, Dan Aykroyd and Jessica Tandy, had this kind of refreshing cosmopolitan outlook, you know, and, and Dan Aykroyd was, was really a, a good guy to everyone around him that we, that we could see, especially... Uh, you know, he had a lot of uh, black employees and seemed to treat them just like anyone else at a time and a place where that might not have been so common. But I think I think they found some um, 
some common ground in, in the fact that his family was Jewish, which, again, in, in the South um, is less common and, and not necessarily going to always uh, ha- be well received. And so I think they kind of had that common, that common experience there that really helped them out. And uh, I don't think that, that Miss Daisy uh, had, a, had a racial issue. I think she was, she was losing her independence and was going to be nasty to, to whomever had the, the job of driving her around. But what I really like is, is Morgan Freeman's character, just the way that he just seems, you know, just um, unspotted by the world. You know, he's, he's just got this kindness about him that, that breaks through everything. And his character was also very aware. You notice that scene where the police officers pulled him over, and, yeah. and you could see the dread on his face. And he he was very worried about what was going to happen, and, and knew full well what could. But that never that never brought him down. And uh, after being the Miss Daisy's punching bag for for year after year, ultimately just kind of wore her down with a kindness that she didn't deserve but was really there inside of him. So, you know, just, just kind of a movie about a, a I, I feel like it's much less about Miss Daisy and much more about Morgan Freeman's character as this, this person who has kind of a, a goodness that just the world tried but couldn't, couldn't wear out of him. Yeah, the, um, I liked what you said, Matt. Just the, the friendships in this movie. When she says, you're my best friend, I lost it. Yeah. I just uh, the rest of the movie I was blubbering. It was embarrassing, and I think I did that the first time I saw it too. And my my son was looking at me like I don't understand why your crimes are. And I was like I don't know. I don't understand either why. I just love these characters, and but yeah, I it, it's it's just such a well done movie, and and the characters are so developed, and they're so realistic, and they're so. Um, you know, we we see them with their faults and all, and and um, I just I just love it. All right. Well, let me extend something else, like a, th- a thought I had watching the film, and is kind of following what Matt had said. Like, you know, the the whole character is like he has this. He understands the way the world is, but he's not going to be deterred. That he, you know, he's going to live somewhat in his own happiness that he's even though there's oppression there's racism um there's threats uh, legitimate threats to his life depending on which way he goes or how he's perceived by law enforcement any day at any point in time miss daisy has she she has blinders on and she doesn't seem to understand things and she doesn't seem to have at least at the beginning she doesn't seem to have that happiness that it granted she's losing a lot of her freedom and she's um, because she can't do things and her son has to take care of her and she has to be taken care of due to her age and i can understand that frustration but she's lived in a world that I, i i wonder who this character was 10 years before this that you know basically you know bully always seems to you know imply that she's always kind of bitching and complaining about things and i don't think she's ever been content and until she gains this friendship this understanding and that the moment of going to the martin luther king speech where you know she kind of half ass asks him to go and he somewhat takes offense about being asked in the car on the way there and that that schism how he doesn't go with her and she goes by herself and he's listening in the car to this monumental speech something of great importance concerning uh race relations and that you know she's starting to understand and is that at that moment in time this understanding that that's the friendship that they're ultimately going to develop and when she when she breaks down and you know and she's you know dementia starts to take over and she tells him that he he's her best friend you know is is she finally finding that kind of that true happiness that she you know that contentment that she seems to lack throughout the rest of the film because at the end the last sequence you know when you know he feeds her the pie and everything like that the simple pleasure of just enjoying a meal together you know that that she, you, you see a lot of uh, of pleasure in her face, her expressions at that point in the film. 
Uh, but can I just add to uh, what Laurie sure. said about crying in that um, remark, in that line, when she says, you're my best friend? It's a, it's a monumental moment in the film, and a lot of it leads up to that. But I have a feeling, because it was kind of controversial, from what I can remember, it winning Best Picture that year at the Oscars. I have a feeling that the Academy voters had that in their mind that entire time, that, that line, which really upscaled the film intently and that was probably a reason they it won just just for that line alone and that that whole scene all right and Chip. and him feeding her the the pie yep just before the fade out exactly yeah. and that's what's going to be on their minds all right uh shane what about symbolism and hidden meanings? <laughs> Well, symbolism I find tough, but I've done my best again. I, I just, uh, in Chris's shoes, it's hard because he's the expert at this. Firstly, I'm thinking of the can of salmon. Salmon swim upstream against all odds and make it to the end of their journey. That's what Hoke's doing the entire film. He gets there in the end. Uh, also, on the number plate, it says, or you call it a license plate, it's called the Peach State. Now, they, she doesn't grow peaches, I don't think. It was just tomatoes that you saw them growing. And a peach and a tomato are opposites. One's a fruit, one's a vegetable, but opposites attract. And if you put them together, they make a really, really nice tomato and peach salad. <laughs> so I thought that was a good symbolism, maybe. You guys um, eat a lot of weird shit down there, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, it's nice. It's a nice salad. The police... Um, scene was sort of relevant to, to, to today. I thought behind their backs, the symbolism of the police showing no respect wasn't delicate. I mean, I'm not sure, but I'm sure maybe it happens still today because the co the police comment that it was she's an old Jew and an old N mm -hmm. word together, and that was just really bad. And that was tame to what would happen but, in Alabama back then. You know what I mean? Yeah. Of course, but that relevance and symbolism was still there. I'm glad they didn't go further with it. They didn't need to. It, it made enough impact just what happened there. Oh, and the final one was early in the piece, They, I think it might have been even the first time that Hope drives Daisy to the store, they park in front of a big Coke sign. And it's on the Coke sign, the Coca-Cola sign, it says, take me home today. And that's all Daisy wanted really for him to take her home directly after. <laughs> I don't know. I'm clutching at straws when it comes to symbolism. I really like the salmon swimming upstream. That was really good. Yeah, I just thought of that because yeah, salmon are, are, are a fish that their mission is to get to where they're going and they have to swim upstream. And basically, Hoke is doing that most of the movie against all odds. Yeah, I really like that. Also, I, I would like to eat a wallaby sometime. <laughs> I don't know what that's like. What is Vegemite? <laughs> well, uh, we don't have wallabies at the supermarket, but you can buy kangaroo steaks. Now you're and, talking. Uh, <laughs> I've never eaten it, by the way. I'm not interested. And Will it make me better at punching things? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Crocodile Dundee eats snake. I would probably try that, but luckily you can't buy it in the um, shop. And Vegemite lorry is a mixture of like a vegetable extract that you put on toast. And it's black and very salty, but nice. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's uh, very unpopular when it comes to anyone other than Australians, though. Sorry. Well, my, <laughs> it seems um, to be. Mike has a friend that's going to Australia next week, and he said he was going to have a Vegemite, and then Mike started singing that song, and he didn't remember it. He goes, you don't remember that song? <laughs> a Vegemite sandwich. <laughs> well, you've, got to, you've got to cook your toast to golden brown, just put a thin layer of butter or margarine, and then pack on the Vegemite. Oh, so you and put add, the, add a fried egg if you feel like it. You put the Vegemite Ooh. on after the butter? Yes. I thought the Vegemite went on instead of butter. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> it can. It can, but I recommend it doesn't. Oh. On on bread, but if you're using toast, butter first. Okay. And he's a professional. Yes, he does that for a living. 
you know, Shane, when it comes to symbolism and hidden meanings, half the stuff that Chris says is basically pulled out of his ass. Um, that it's it's in the eyes of the, the, the viewer. Every once in a while, you can you get the benefit of a, a writer, director, actor commenting that this was certain things were intentional. Otherwise, they're just you know magic to that we like to create some symbolism, such as the salmon. I doubt that that was intentional, but it's a nice little you know nugget of information. I I, I like that. I at least uh, I think that plays well with the the characters in this film. Throw it out there and hope something sticks. Exactly. Just like Vegemite. It sticks. So. <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> to bring it That's all stuck. full circle. To make it all make sense. All right. Uh, because Shane's on the podcast, we have to talk about some music. Because Shane loves to talk about music. And I'm sure you li- love this soundtrack, Shane. Yeah. Well, um, music and um, composers and, and scores are, are very important to me in any movie. And this one... I always remember the tune and there's a lot more to it than just the tune, but that's what people do remember. And I thought it was catchy. It works. And the fact it was Hans Zimmer was a total shock. I did not realize it was him who was the composer and he very, considering some of the scores he's done since it's a little bit lighter than normal, but it worked for me and I quite, quite liked it. And, it does bring back memories from when I first heard that tune in the cinema, seeing the film for the first time. It's catchy. You know, I was really surprised. That, so this is the first time I've seen this movie. I was really surprised how 80s the, the music felt, given the time when the, the story started, at least. You 50s. Know, like, so, I, you know, he is a very 80s synthesizer type sound, and it was distracting for me, especially at first when I was watching a 50s period piece with very distinctly 80s sounding synthesizer score. I, I, I think something else would have been much more appropriate for this one. You know, I have not seen this movie for, I don't think I've seen it since I saw it in theaters, in a theater. I didn't go to more than one. But I, the moment I heard the theme music, I remembered it and I remembered loving it and it just it was like an old friend playing so I really like the music in this and and I just think it fits the film really well and I think it helps with the setting and stuff and it's funny because I read that in your notes that it was all synthesizer and it didn't sound like synthesizer to me I guess I don't know it just until I read that that didn't occur to me I'm the same, actually. Um, you, you saying that, Matt? I I know it was synthesizer, but I really wouldn't have thought I related it to an '80s sounding synthesizer. So um, I hate to disagree, but I disagree with you. I guess I think all synthesizers sound like '80s to me. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, no, may- I have saxophone <laughs> fatigue from the '80s. Oh yeah, <laughs> saxophone yeah. makes me think '80s. If they if they had played saxophone, they would have lost me. <laughs> saxophone in front of a, a open fireplace <laughs> <laughs> well i'm gonna agree with shane and Lori. like I, I i've only seen this film pro- this is probably the third time in my life i saw it i saw it pr- probably in early 1990s when it first came out on vhs probably saw it in mid 90s and it's been at least 20 23 years since i've seen it but I remember the music. As soon as it started on, it was it was very memorable. It was very catchy. I was not bothered by the fact that it was synth- synthesizers at all. In fact, as when I was doing the research and I saw that note, I was like, "Is it really?" And I actually went back and watched uh, about twenty minutes of the film, and I went, "Wow, it is." And it wasn't. I didn't find it distracting at all. I thought it was. It, I, w- I was more shocked at. I I think of Hans Zimmer as. You know, providing the score to like the Dark Knight and the dark and dreary sounds that he usually comes up with, and and this seems just so happy compared to what he usually composes that it seems very uh, unusual for him. But it was very early on in his career. Uh, but it's I, warm. I think of warmth when I hear this music. I, I think I honestly think of this music, and I think it's time to go for a drive. I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. So. <laughs> All right. Driving Miss Lacey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's all I do all weekend long. 
All right. Uh, ending of the film. What did you guys think of the ultimate ending uh, of this film? Uh, the where and where they chose to end the story, uh, Lori. I was so happy where they ended it because I don't think I could have taken either one of them dying. I really don't. I was um, a mess. <laughs> it was. It's so beautiful. I I think it ended perfectly. And and something I thought of when we were talking about. Morgan Freeman's character evolving. What was it that his his granddaughter did? He did she gave him a lift at the end. Yeah, she, what was her he profession? He was saying that she was thirty seven, and she went to college. And I want to say she was so, a do- doctor. Hopefully, she wasn't a lawyer. <laughs> um, I just that was so. I loved that. I loved that he had worked so hard his whole life for his family to have a better life than he had. And I love, again, this movie is so subtle. It's not preachy. I just, I adore this movie. I think Lori is telegraphing her punches. I, 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 don't, I don't even want to know yet if this is in her top 100, but I'm getting my suspicions up. I think it ended right where it should have. And I can't remember who made this point earlier, but I think by then that Daisy had found her, her peace, right? She had found her happiness in, in truly valuable things like sincere friendship. And um, at that point, she had, she'd really committed herself to finding joy in it. So it was um, everything her character needed, she had at that point, and it was time to end the movie. So I think it was the right choice for sure. Very good choice. Totally agree uh, with Laurie and Matt that the ending was perfect because I'm glad he could have had a funeral. He could have had a Daisy funeral or a Hoke funeral, I guess, but... It just faded out, and they were together. That that worked for me. It was great. Good ending. And uh, that will make all four of us. I, I agree with you. With this film, what they intended to do, and where I think were the, the character arcs of the two characters, I think that was the perfect ending of it. If you'd gone a little bit further to see either one of the characters pass away and the other character remain... I think it's too sad and it takes away from the underlying message of the film is that these two had found companionship and friendship um, in a non-romantic way, which was, is very unusual for in that capacity, but and happiness in it. And I thought that was a really good meaning, a, a good place to end the film. And I will go back to once again, that whole Martin Luther King speech is a Hollywood way would have been, for them to have some sort of discussion or speech after that speech or for hope to have gone in with her and the fact that they sat out away from each other and showed that truth that there was still a division between the two of them there was still um, a separation is was a very un-Hollywood way of dealing with the racism even in that context and I think it was a realistic way of doing it and I think that only by showing these characters evolve over decades you know or many many years do you really show that you know people can change and sometimes it's not it's unrealistic to be sudden and that's what i i ultimately liked about it is that they found each other over time by you know by understanding each other and truly understanding each other because they got to know each other yep and i want to mention too that this year, and I guess it happens all over, over the world, but there was a stage play of it in Sydney, a production earlier this year, uh, actually last year, and it had um, James L. Jones and Angela Lansbury in the two leads, which I didn't go to see, unfortunately. <laughs> that would be <laughs> that amazing. Would be, <clears throat> wow. It would have been, yes. Mm-hmm. All right, let's talk about the film's legacy. Nominated for nine Academy Awards, winning four. Uh, won Best Picture, Best Actress for Jessica Tandy, Best, best Makeup, Best Writing uh, for a screenplay based on material from another medium. Lost Best Actor, uh, Morgan Freeman lost to Daniel Day-Lewis for My Left Foot. Best Supporting Actor, Dan Aykroyd lost to Denzel Washington for Glory. Best Art Direction, Set Decoration, lost to Batman. And Best Costume Design, lost to Henry V. And finally, uh, Best Film Editing, lost to Born on the Fourth of July. Uh, Note that Shane put in his summary, the film that directed itself, uh, Bruce Beresford, was not nominated for Best Director for this film, which is a rarity. And I think at that point was only the 
third film in history for the best picture not to have the best director win. And Bruce Beresford, if I remember correctly, Shane, Australian? Yes, he's an Australian. And I I interviewed him only maybe two months ago. There was a a new Australian film that came out that was a big hit here recently called Ladies in Black. And he he was the director of that. And um, I only got a couple of minutes with him on the red carpet, but it was the first time I'd ever met him. And I mentioned that we were doing a podcast of... uh, driving miss daisy coming up and i said is there anything that you can tell me that i don't already know and he just laughed at me and said what don't you already know so <laughs> i didn't really have the question researched unfortunately so. but it, um he did say he, he enjoyed it and the legacy he used the word legacy how how people are still enjoying it today and yeah um he's australian very um popular australian director does a lot of work still he it always been contentious, though, um, even amongst our industry, our film industry down here, why he wasn't nominated for Best Director, and it does get brought up. So, um, yep, still a little contentious, but in reality, I don't think it would have been that hard a movie to direct when you think about it. Mm. Um, and it was a it was a year where there was some huge, difficult, controversial films around and different kinds of movies with directors and and subject matter, do the right thing, Dead Poet Society and so forth. So um, he's a strange director that might, you know, you never know, he might get nominated again, but it's been a while since he's done a big Hollywood film. Also in the legacy AFI, uh, Driving Miss Davisy was included in the list of 400 films being considered for the top 100 uh, in 1997. Ultimately, it did not make the final list, the film ended up grossing $145 million worldwide. Rotten Tomatoes has an 82% critics, 81% audience, and that is essentially the legacy of this film. So, uh, we get to our big wrap-up. Uh, what do you think of the legacy, and would you put this in your top 100? Lori? The legacy is perfect, and this may surprise Matt, but I think it is in my top 100. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> The fix was in, Matt. I knew it from the get-go. Uh, yeah, seriously. It was fixed. <laughs> <laughs> Matt? This is the first time I saw this movie, and I'm glad I watched it, because this is never a movie I think I would have watched otherwise. You know, I don't I don't really like a lot of sentimental movies. So I, I thought it was really good. I admired the acting performances and the writing. But, like, the, the this type of story just really doesn't tug at my heartstrings so it, i i got a little bored in it and um you know I, I didn't really have a a real emotional reaction to it so good movie not not mine so i'm very glad we watched it but i would leave it out of my top 100 i really like this film uh, i liked it back when i saw it the first time i actually rewatched it in the mid 90s when i was working in the video store and I haven't touched it in a long time. I, I had just had no reason to to go back and revisit it. But in, to be all honest, it's it's a film that once I felt I've seen, I didn't feel like I re- needed to re-see. I enjoyed watching it again. I really think it's a really, really, really good movie. I think it was deserving of the Oscars. I, also, I won't agree with Laurie and say that the legacy is appropriate. I'm kind of surprised that there's a lack of legacy here, that there isn't more attention to it. For, um, on AFI or that it hasn't been considered for uh, the National Film Registry. It, it seems like a type of film that would get that kind of attention. So I'm a, I'm a little shocked at that. That all being said, I wouldn't put in my top 100 and not because it's not a good film. It's just I got you know 100 other films that I like better than this and probably a few more than that. It's a great movie. I somebody should Anybody should see it. It's been remade a couple times for television and it's been a, you know it was originally a play and it's been uh, continues to be a play with you know stellar cast as Shane's already ma- uh, mentioned so um, it is a story that I think still has uh, emotional and uh, social uh, relevance today uh, especially in the United States when we still have a lot of issues concerning racism and other things right now so I I really like the film not my top 100 100 but uh, Shane, it is Shane's film, so he gets the last word. Uh, well, I have a sentimental history with this film. I, I do really enjoy it, and it's off the off the bat. It is in my one hundred top one hundred for sure. My grandmother, my late grandmother. I mean, we she took me to the movies a lot, and I remember seeing Cocoon with her. And for some reason, that 
uh, like she just kept on going on about Jessica Tandy after we came out that day. And I was only young, but I always remember going her going on about Jessica Tandy. So we basically saw every movie that Jessica Tandy done after that, you know, the fried green tomatoes, used people, um, uh, you know, just stuff that she was in. And when it came to Driving Miss Daisy, I think my, nan just, my nana just related to it. And I always remember that. It was just a really beautiful experience of sitting there enjoying a movie that I might not have already, might not have seen with on my own. It was just because of my age at the time. And uh, I haven't watched it a lot since. I guess I had it on in the video shop when I worked there for a while. I remember putting it on there because it was rated G and you could just put it on and let it let it play. I've got a DVD copy, which I rewatched for uh, this podcast, and it's not a very good copy. It's in widescreen, but it's a little bit grainy and the sound track wasn't good. So I should really update to a Blu-ray. And I remember over the years how there was, you know, why did it win this best picture? You know, that was something that got brought up quite a lot. I kind of agree it is an unusual choice for best picture, but obviously the story, the art direction, everything about it, including the acting, really resonated with people and still does. Well, it did me watching it again. And I used to hear all the time that it was Driving Miss Daisy was like an equivalent to a Hallmark movie or a midday matinee TV film, which I don't believe it was. Like around that time, you think about it, there was movies like Remains of the Day and Age of Innocence and... There was movies that just were for an older audience, and I think this was definitely one that kicked basically all the goals, all the right goals, and I, I totally enjoyed it and will continue to enjoy it because it reminds me of my grandma. All right. To, to argue for Driving Miss Daisy winning the Best Picture, that year the Best Picture nominees were Born on the Fourth of July, Dead Poets Society, Driving Miss Daisy, Field of Dreams and My Left Foot. Of those, does, tough year. T- tough year is that you're saying all great films and it's hard to pick one, or tough year that there's no standout. Well, I'm not sure that My Left Foot <coughs> could have won, but yeah, I think they were good films, very good films. Dead Poets Society as well. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of those. I couldn't really weigh in. Laurie, you've got to have seen all these by now. Uh-uh. <laughs> I have not see- seen my left foot. I have not seen Born on the Fourth of July. Oh my God! I saw. I, I, Bo- tr- I tried to watch my left foot, and and again, I just I couldn't get into it. it in- oh, I saw Born on the Fourth of July with Emilio Estevez. What were you doing with Emilio Estevez? Was uh, that in Tucson? It was in Tucson. He was filming Young Guns too. He sat uh, in the row in front of me, uh, yeah. and which was kind of weird. He's very short. Well, Oliver Stone won Best Director. That Best year Director, for- yeah. Born on the 4th um, of July. And uh, another Australian connection, Peter Weir was also di- Director uh, nominated for, for Dead, Dead Poets Society. Society. And he's yep. an Aussie, of course. I, you know, like, I remember at the time really liking Born on 4th of July, but I remember there was controversy about the creative license that Oliver Stone took with the film. Um, and so that there was uh, some, some, some backlash over that. And then if you take that out of the equation, you have four kind of small films with uh, what I would say... They're, they're not epic or bombastic in any way. They're very quiet. You know, My Left Foot, Dead Poet Society, Field of Dreams, and Driving Miss Daisy are all essentially just, you know, pretty straightforward, simple stories that, uh, you know, that's, that's you know, I, I, I remember Born on the Fourth of July was predicted to win, and then Driving Miss Daisy did. And there was, there was I remember backlash, people being shocked at it, but... Looking at the list now, uh, with the benefit of time, I love Field of Dreams. I love that film. Dead Poet Society, I love that film. Um, Born on the Fourth of July is a good film. Uh, I, I, that one has not aged well for me over time. Um, it is a little bit, a little bit scenery chewing by Tom Cruise and uh, William Defoe in that film, and it, it's I, I don't appreciate it as much as I did at the time. Um, I don't think it is is important a film as I thought it was in its time. And my left foot is, I think it's got a stellar acting performance, but the rest of the film I find is pretty run of the mill. So I'm not shocked driving Miss Daisy wins, you know, looking at it now, uh, you know, it's, but I, I, you know, I like dead poets. Society. I've probably seen dead poets society. Well, I know I've seen field of dreams way more than I've seen driving Miss Daisy, but 
you know, Dead Poets Society, I've probably only seen about five or six times in my life. And, and that's a, a really decent film, but I, it, it's very similar as far as a, a simplistic Hallmark movie, if you will. <laughs> Yeah. I hear what you're saying, that, though, Matt, as well, about not being able to get through by their foot because it is, it's a harsh, true story, and the uh-huh. acting by Daniel Day-Lewis was so effective. But it wasn't, a, I mean, it was probably borderline worthy, but, yeah, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought it was the best picture. No, and if you look at it, you had two directors, uh, Woody Allen for Crimes and Misdemeanors and Kenneth Branagh for Henry V, nominated who were not, did not have Best Picture nominations. So you have Field of Dreams and Driving Miss Daisy without their directors being nominated for the film. I'd say Kenneth Brenner cancelled out Bruce Beresford in that Pro- instance. Probably, yeah. Well, that- see, Crimes and Misdemeanors had the screenplay and the um, acting sort of nominations, so maybe that's why he got nominated for director as well. Well, yeah, but that was that's a universal component of almost any Woody Allen film from like the early yeah, 1980s true. to the mid 1990s is uh, probably up to even Mighty Aphrodite in the late 90s is that he got if you were in it you had a chance of being nominated for an Academy Award if you're an actor true. or actress. Yeah. All right, that does it for this week's review of Driving Miss Daisy. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little bi-weekly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. As we stated before, you can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories on either Facebook or Twitter. You can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network, including The Golden Age of the Silver Screen, The Number Two Review, Movie House Concessions, Lunchtime Movie Review, Noirsville, and Criterion Critics. And again, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you download us off of either iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to rate our podcast on either one of those two platforms. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. All right. Well, that does it for this episode of Movie House Memories. Uh, Next time, it will be Chris's pick for one of the greatest films of all time, and he is choosing 1968's Once Upon a Time in the West. Uh, Until then, I'm Patrick. I'm Lori. And I'm Shane. And I'm Matt. And we'll see you all next time at our house. This podcast is not endorsed by Warner Home Video and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Driving Miss Daisy, all names and sounds of Driving Miss Daisy characters, and any other Driving Miss Daisy related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Warner Home Video or their respective trademark and or copyright holders. The theme music for Movie House Memories, Hiding Your Reality, is provided courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incomputech.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content of this podcast is intellectual property of the MHN Podcast Network, Movie House Memories, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.